Hi, welcome to Talking With. I'm your host, Yale Cohen. We have been off the air for a little while running some reruns. I had to be in Chicago for some family stuff, but it is great to be back in Iowa City. It is great to be back here at PTV, and it is really great to bring to you our first ever one-hour episode. We're jumping right into the saddle with the four non-incumbent, the four challenger uh, candidates for the upcoming Iowa City City Council election, which is going to be on Tuesday, November 5th, just a few days away. There's also early a vote, voting available all over town. I'm very pleased to welcome to the show this evening the four candidates, Catherine Champion, Kingsley Botchway, Royce Ann Porter, and Rock Nicole. Thank you all so very much for joining us, and thank you all for running. You know, whether you win or lose, yeah. it's very important to have people involved in the community, involved in local politics, and I know it's no small commitment, and you're worn out. We're at the tail end of the race here. Uh, we were just talking before we came on air that you've been to like six or seven candidate forums. Uh, already where, where you come to speak to different groups and, and they'll ask questions for you. But I'm really grateful to have you here today where we can have a discussion with each other. No time limits, none of that, you know, kind of, you know, stodgy uh, library behavior. So, uh, right out of the gate, before we even talk about this election and the various issues that are important to you all, important to the community, I want to talk about voter turnout. I was looking beforehand at the numbers from the last uh, election, a city council election, which was in 2011. And, you know, Iowa City likes to pat itself on the back as a very informed and enthused and engaged town. But we had, you know, 13.6% turnout in the last city council election. We just had a, a school board election just a few weeks ago. I think the uh, turnout there was less than 13%. To say that's abysmal is giving it more credit than it's worth. Why is it so low? And uh, what can we do about that? Okay, do you mind if I start? Because we, start. there was an article, I mean, I know that nobody wants to talk about this because it's sort of horrible, but <laughs> there was an article in the paper that showed our voting records, mm. which are not that great. And you know what I said is, I just said, listen, I consider myself to be a good citizen, and I feel like I vote for the things that are important to me. Exactly. And that's how I feel. Exactly. I'm not, you know... If I'm speaking for the three, I think we're all on that same page. If school board is important to me, I'll vo vote in school board. And I don't think that Iowa City is not committed or connected in a whole as a whole. I just think that people vote for what they're connected to. Yes. And I vote in general elections, and I vote in city council elections, and then school board where I'm abreast of the topics. You know. Point being, no matter who's elected, the the, the citizenry or constituency. I have no qualms whatsoever about complaining about the actions that the city council takes, that the school board takes, etc. Yes. Yet, less than 20% on average are participating in this. Why do you, what do you think informs that? I mean, Catherine said it's important to her. It's clearly important enough for people to complain about, to write letters to the editor, to start groups. Wait, I think those stuff. are the same people voting, too. Really? <laughs> yeah. So who, who, who are the, who, who is this other, you know, 85% of the people that aren't voting? Who are they? Well, I guess I'll go next. And, I mean, uh, and you work at the auditor's office, correct. so you're uh, directly involved in, in that kind of stuff? Well, not necessarily okay. uh, for voter turnout. I mean, we try to push out voter turnout as much as possible. But, you know, Catherine's right. You know, you have that level, and we're saying I think spoke to that as well, and Rockney as well. You know, you have that, I guess, uh, portion that people vote because they um, are abreast of the issues and they care about the issues, so they'll vote. Um, adding on to that is um, the particular people that you know don't necessarily think they have a voice, um, or uh, don't necessarily think that you know their points will be heard, or don't know that you know local elections affect you in in a way that's um, to me more important than actually the general election. Um, as far as the time frame, you know, um, the city council can put together an ordinance in about two to three months, um, and you know, Obamacare is still waiting to roll out. So, um, from that standpoint, it's just I think there's just a lack of education of the effect that city um, and local municipalities or local governments have on you, um, not only as a voter but also as a citizen um, or a resident of Iowa City. And so, um, looking at that from that standpoint. It's just doing our best to uh, get out and educate people, and this is such an important time. You know, this is right after the general, where we had the highest turnout that we've had um, in Iowa City, uh, in Johnson County, that is um, at large. And so, you know, this is the point where there's so many people registered that you should expect more turnout. And again, I think to a certain extent, I like the fact, or I guess I can't say I like the fact that there's low turnout, but you have people that are literally um, making sure that they're very knowledgeable about the issue. Um, before they go out and vote. And I think that's also what happened at the school board election because if you saw it, turnout was relatively slow and then all of a sudden there's a boost at the end because yes. people Boom. were really paying attention and saying, you know, 
A, how is this person going to work well with the issues that I have and I hold dear? I mean, there, there's some argument that can be said on the national scale, but I don't want to turn it into national stuff about that voting might be difficult, this and that. In Iowa City, it's so remarkably easy. I mean, I went into my bathroom this morning to brush my teeth. There's a 70-year-old woman there with a laptop asking me if I registered to vote She was in yet. your bathroom? Yeah, their vo early saying. voting is everywhere. The personalized <laughs> early voting. There's someone come to your house to just make sure that you've... So it's, yeah. it's remarkably easy to vote in this town. But you know what, Dale? And there's so many issues, though. How, where, where do people not connect that those issues, as, as Kingsley said, are important to them and they're participation makes a difference. You know, I think if things are are like going well, people, or if they sense no perceptible change, they don't do anything about it. The other thing is that there's no centralized news service anymore. I mean, I cannot be any clear about the way information travels in different paths. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it was a newspaper. Everyone went there for their information. The whole town knew where to go. Now it's a combination of Facebook, Twitter, yard signs, newspaper, five in forums, um, three, two public as access channels. I mean, all these things to spread a message that people like, this morning I spoke at City High, which King Kingsley and I did the other day as well, and these kids That's get their right. messages from six different mediums. So I will let other people talk now, but that's how I feel about it. I think Orson can speak to particularly the question that you just said. I just feel like if it's no interest, they're not going to come out. You know, I'll I speak on behalf of the African American people. Um, those that have felons cannot vote. So we have those here. And so they can't vote. Um, not that they probably don't want to because they paid their time and did their time or whatever, but when they get out, they just can't vote. And personally, um, even with the person who did the article, he was really nasty with me by telling me about the percentages of how many times I've voted and then turn around and say, why should anybody vote for you? <laughs> you know, right, Sam, I think he said, said that to everyone, so I wouldn't take it, yeah. I mean, he I wouldn't was, take it yeah. so personally. Oh, I didn't. I just yeah. told him what yeah. I had to tell him yeah. and told him, you know. I well, mean, we were all in the same <laughs> category, so, you yeah. know, no one here is an angel. But with, with how many issues there are, particularly in this election, and I guess you could argue that that was the case, each election has its own right. sort of important issues, but just looking again at the numbers from two years ago, you know, the highest, uh, I think it was it was Mayor Hayek, he had, you know, 4,500 votes. I've been to bigger parties than that. That's not a lot of people in a town of, you know, mm -hmm. near to 70,000 people. Where, uh, you know, how do we how do we bridge that disconnect? I mean, even if, if people can't vote or if they're just not involved in it, my personal feeling is that it's too important to ignore. Rockney, what would you say to that? Well, you know, for me, I came here in 1997, and one of my very first counselors that I observed was Karen Covey. And I just assumed, living in a progressive community like we have, that we would have more voices like Karen Covey, like a Jim Throgmorton. Um, but if you look at the dynamic of the current council, they've become remarkably conservative. Um, I do not think they have listened very well. Um, I know Councilor Mims has talked repeatedly about the fact that they do listen. But if you look at it, I've sat through those meetings where you have incredibly articulate people share their vision with the council, literally reading back to them the comprehensive plan or, or detailed analysis of, of the city code. And they make all these points, and it's 61616161. So it's not the question of whether they're listening or not. The question is, is whether they're engaging with the community. And what I've seen is a lot of the people that are in graduate school, that do have their professional degrees, they come to Iowa City, they assume that you're going to have a council that looks like a, a Karen Covey progressive, and you just don't see it. Um, so finally, I got to the point where I saw this council making some just terrible decisions uh, that just did not really reflect the value of the community. And I think the other thing is, is there's some real tension growing in the community because they're not listening. Um, the fact that she perceives herself as listening, I think itself is a problem when you have this level of attention that has not been expressed. I think Roy Sand has brought up some fabulous points about the suffering that people have endured in this community uh, that they've expressed repeatedly over the course of 20 to 25 years and nothing is done. And so I think that in terms of voting, we need to be able to actually start participating or we have no one else to blame but ourselves. Well, that's, that's an interesting point you raise and it segues into something else I wanted to ask is that each one of you have said, you know, I'm gonna listen to the community, I'm gonna be receptive. <laughs> I think your slogan is uh, connecting uh, citizenry to the government. But at the same time, everyone who's ever successfully run for office has made those same promises. Mm, and yet, true. yet, nonetheless, so to, yes. to varying degrees, um, it true. seems like there's there's a feeling, as, as Rockney articulated and as I've certainly uh, expressed before, that they're not listening. So to the folks watching at home, to the folks watching on the Internet, you're making the same promises the folks are in there now, not specifically, but that we're going to listen. We're going to... 
how how are you different? Why do we believe not you individually, but how do we believe this batch of political candidates in Iowa City? I guess for me to answer that first, I mean, uh, to me, I've and consistently asked when I've been door knocking, when I've been in any type of public forum, you know, hold me accountable. I want those calls late at night. I want that um, uh, you to knock on my door. I mean, that's that's what I believe a city council member should be. That's what I believe I want to be um, as a candidate running for this office. Um, you know, if I if I can't do that or um, or I, I just I decide to backtrack or whatever the case may be, then I want that criticism. You know, I want that um, that hot seat. You know, you think about coaches in football and how they're on the hot seat. You know, I want that type of engagement because that's why I like local politics. You can literally walk down the street and somebody can just meet you and talk to you about the issue that might be upsetting them. Now, I obviously think that you should do it in a respectful manner, uh -huh. um, but you know, still having that type of camaraderie is lost to me on you know, larger elections. And so that accountability is something that I actually pushed out to the community and, and making me a, a better council member. And then also from another standpoint is getting out in the community, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, doing it from a point, you know, I, I, I mean, I was kind of dreaming on, you know, if I was a city council member <laughs> um, and where I would sit. And, you know, I thought about the fact of like, hey, what if it would be cool and totally like, uh, probably, probably, probably wrong from that standpoint, but what if I just sat out in the audience instead of having to sit on the lofted seats of city council members? Or what if I decided to be that type of reporter that was like, hey, I'm broadcasting out the satellite at Broadway, um, where I'm, I'm here with the people um, at the Broadway neighborhood. Uh, I'm gonna do um, my portion from here, and you can do your portion from there. But you know that community input that you know you kind of see on TV when people do that, where people are showing signs or whatever the case may be. You know you can we can engage the community in a different way. And a lot of the ways Catherine talked about, um, do it in a way where you we either figure out some type of centralized system or we hit Twitter, we hit Facebook mm -hmm. in ways that we haven't done before, but other communities are doing. Um, and so that's where I, I guess I feel like I would be, um, as far as a city council member, um, doing it in a different way and trying to engage everybody. And I, I mentioned this at the other forum. I want to be everywhere. I mean, I think it's just, I just want to be everywhere. I, from an entertainment perspective, I think that's great. It's like the Dick Clark New Year special, just with each <laughs> yeah. counselor and their yeah. own thing. But, you know, as, as I said, other, other, other mm -hmm. sitting uh, uh, officials have, have made that promise, and yet it seems they sometimes are, are act in a tone-deaf way. Is that a disconnect? Is that a function of politics itself? They're like, well, now we're up here on the raised seats. No. We, what happens? Raise hand. I truly believe the reason I wanted to run for District B is because I have put in the time, because I am in the community. You can talk to a lot of people. I am in the community. I'm involved, and I wanted to represent District B, B because the people in District B know who I am. I have put in the time. So one of the things I wanted to do if elected on city council is just reach out to the people, um, even the way Karen Covey did it, have outside you know, groupings. We can meet at Hy-Vee in the back room and continue the conversations. This does not have to be the beginning, but we, were, we, we can just have uh, conversations that included everybody, anybody interested, you know, and just make people feel like they are a part of, they're involved. So, so. since the other three uh, candidates here are running for at large positions yes. and you're running against a seated uh, councilman, uh, Terry Dickens, yes. how has Mr. Dickens not reached out to the community not had that kind of engagement that you think none you of the people that I work with know anything about Mr. Dickens. No, we haven't seen Mr. Dickens at none of the um, community events, nothing in the community. And um, we've had events where we've invited the chief of police and all the police officers and city council members, and they just don't come. He has not been involved. So people in the community, maybe they know that Terry Dickens owns a jewelry store or he's made a name. A lot of people. Um, is talking about you know the homeless people in front of his store, but just to get out there knowing that Terry Dickens represents District B, I will say not. No. I think I think clearly all of you here, <coughs> as you mentioned, having been engaged in the community in different boards and forums, yes. you all have experience yes. with that kind of stuff. Whether it's downtown, yes. coalition for racial, I mean, I could go on and on. Yes. Laundry list of engagements, but uh, th that involvement aside, why are you all running? Now, clearly these are things that were important to you two years ago, four years ago, you didn't run. Maybe you were involved in other things, you weren't available. Why are you running now? Well, at least in my view, I think the current council majority really suffers from a lack of vision. I think that they're, they're inflicting serious stress on the community that doesn't need to occur. Um, of course, I'm very close to the co-op community. Look at the co-op. The co-op is one of the most dynamic businesses in downtown Iowa City with a 45-year track record. 
Um, they want to expand. They want to get out of higher ground. And essentially, that's blocked by city council of views. It is nothing more than a grocery store. Setting aside from the co-op, you look at the Duke Street project. Um, right now, they, the, one of the original proposals was 500 plus one. All the candidates have talked about a 100 plus one flood stage. But you look at that, that's the same problem as well. You essentially have a healthy neighborhood, Bella Vista, the north side, that's now being placed under stress by these development decisions. So in my view, if the council is placing stress on already su uh, successful existing institutions, how can we possibly expect them to have the inspiration to work with other parts of the downtown or even, you know, for example, the Sycamore Mall, if they have that sort of vision? I think they're screwing up things that are already successful. I just, frankly, I don't trust them. Um, I think that they're, they're, they're well-intentioned. Um, but we've had a lot of really um, incredibly progressive people with, with really good ideas that's consistently blocked. And I would beg to differ with you in terms of all politicians don't listen. I cite Councillor Throgmorton. Um, he's a role model for me. I see him out of the community. After the Trayvon Martin incident, he stood with the people. After we had some incidents relating to our, our immigrant community when they were mistreated by the police and, and investigated for their trailer titles, he stood at the candlelight vigil. That's who I want to emulate. And I think people can sort of base it upon their one-on-one -on -one conversations. I want them to approach me on the street and share their vision with me, look me in the eye, and I'm going to listen to them. And one of the most gratifying things so far is that one of my best ways of connecting people is to listen to what they have to say. And I think that's why we've gotten the momentum that we have in the campaign. What about you, Catherine? Why are you running now? Well, I mean, two years ago, my mother was on the council, so I didn't think it would be a very good, like, mad magazine by spy versus spy thing to have me running with my mother. But, <coughs> um, you know... I moved back to Iowa City seven years ago. I moved around for 15 years prior to that. I held a multitude of jobs. And the one thing that I always did, like in every city I moved to, is I got involved with what was going on. And the thing that, in my last city, San Francisco, is that I was like, you know, there I am a million miles away from my family. I have 10 people in my immediate family. I'm not close to them. I'm not close to the city I grew up in and the things I want to do, like get involved in my community, have more roots, not be traveling on a plane 24 hours a day with a phone under my pillow. And it's just not who I am, and it never was. So I moved back to Iowa City. I immediately joined the board of the downtown associate. I mean, immediately. I called them and was basically like strong arm my way on the board. I had to, you know. I invested every dime I had into this downtown, every single dime. And um, after the downturn in 2008, where I didn't know if I would have businesses, then I really made a mental resolve to pull the businesses that we had together because the downtown climate and the city's climate, all these things had changed, and I didn't see a reaction to it. I mean, I saw that people were like, yeah, the bank's getting bigger. Yeah, the bars are like four you know, buildings now. Yeah, Sycamore's sort of, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an aggressive downtrend, but it was definitely a passive one, is the best way I'll put it. So um, I knew that there was a way for us to begin talking as a group and as a community. And so we, I became the president of the Downtown Association. I really tried to pull businesses together to communicate, to share things so we can become stronger as a unit. And we transi transitioned into the Smith idea and I became the past president of that and the head of the marketing committee. Which for those unfamiliar with the acronym is self-sustaining municipal, municipal tax district. Yeah, okay. So um, incremental tax actually. Um, so what our, our number one goal for the Smith district, which is the goal for our entire town is engaging our community, is re-engaging our 66,000 residents, is reaching out to the 19.5 thousand people in Coralville and to the 40 plus thousand people in our immediate outlying areas that feed into Iowa City, They're, that are feeder communities. And we have to engage those people because as I spoke to before, there's no centralized news service. There's no way for people to work together and get one message out. So um, I knew my mother was retiring. I, it was a really great opportunity for me. I happened to have some time because I wasn't doing a special project. The last two years I did a store that focused only on local, local um, artists or a place to sell their goods. I didn't turn anyone away. And last year with Revival I did a partnership where we gave, we resold the goods that we had sold in the community and gave all the money to charities in need, including the Crisis Center, Domestic Violence, and uh, United Action for Youth. Kingsley. So it was a great time for me, and I wanted to 
you know, I knew I had energy, I could get things done, I'm project minded, I'm focused on people. I mean, it's just a perfect fit for me, I think. Kingsley, why now? Um, a lot of it centered around, uh, I guess to go back further, um, it was, you know, being in law school and putting out about 400 hours of community service um, and pro bono work. Uh, I kind of rest my hat on that because it was a lot of time <laughs> I put in. Uh, but then also, um, uh, with that, you know, developing the IOVI, which a lot of people don't know, is the Iowa Law Volunteerism Initiative Program with two other people. Um, and then that kind of got incorporated with the Citizen Lawyer Program. But basically what that did was organize law students to get out in the community in ways that they haven't before or um, they haven't in other law schools in the area. Uh, and so really from that, that kind of put me out in the community, uh, teaching GED classes, working with youth, that I would never have done, and normally law students don't do. We usually sit in our hole and cry to ourselves about whatever test we have to take. Um, from that just came, you know, meeting the people in the community, whether it's through basketball, whether it was just through talking with people, just meeting people. Um, it just worked itself out. And then working on different community, I mean, boards, like you talked about, I mean, everybody has an expansive list. Um, but really it came, you know, being becoming the chair um, of the Ad Hoc Diversity Committee and seeing a lot of the issues um, that were consistently coming up and, and not understanding, you know, coming to coming to live in a progressive city, why you still have these issues. You know, everybody talks about how, you know, this is such a great town, this is a great place to live, and I agree with that. However, there's this entire other part of the population that feels drastically different and not understanding why, one, they haven't had a regular voice in different meetings or all these council meetings and uh, meetings between local municipalities and why we're, we're still talking about it. You know, uh, I, I frequently go back to a quote that uh, Professor Boyd, Willer Boyd, Sandy Boyd, whatever you want to call him, I call him Professor Boyd um, to that extent. Um, you know, he talks about Iowa City and he says, you know, uh, Iowa City uh, loved diversity until uh, it got it. And that resonated with me in so many different ways uh, because I think there's just been a, a forgotten part of Iowa City, a tale of two cities that we've talked about in other forums where we uh, we haven't brought it together and talked about the city and pushing the city forward together. Um, that really made me think, well, wait a minute, you know, what's going on? And then from that, you know, you ask questions about, you know, I speak about myself from having to, um, uh, to not have a car for five and a half years. Why is everything coalesced downtown? Downtown is very vital and important to Iowa City. I totally agree with that. But, you know, for the fact that I live on the west side now, uh, there isn't much out there except like Coach's Corner, uh, Sushi Popo, the Java House. You know, it'd be nice to have like a nicer restaurant down there, a little more diversity of business um, that I think would bring people out or, you know, uh, moms to walk their kids with their stroller, whatever the case may be in different areas in Iowa City. The southeast side, the east side, you know, what are we doing to really do a better job as far as economically developing those areas? So people feel like, you know, for those people that can't get downtown, because we want to push walkability, we want to push um, uh, not using your car so much because of the different traffic, or excuse me, because of the dense car um, population downtown and also the parking issues, uh, what can we do to do a better job? And so it then just became a kind of over expansive look at Iowa City and looking at different things and hoping that um, I can be that person to guide us to do different things. Roy Sannon, just as I mentioned, <coughs> like everyone else's long list of boards and, and community involvement that you're on, uh, why are you running now? And what do you think you can do? Uh, and I guess any of you can answer this one, Roy Sanson, but what do you think you can do as a council member that you can't do just as, as a member of these various boards and, and community organizations and stuff like that? Well, for me, it was um, last last May, I was able to attend um, the University of Iowa. They uh, got me in as an intern, and I was able to attend the leadership conference, and it was the women's, all women of all important women here. Every, I mean, every woman that somebody here in higher titles or whatever was a part of it. And they constantly just tell you that you are somebody and that you can represent, you know, as women. You know, um, we got to go to Jean Lloyd Jones' house for supper. I mean, just, it was, it was a beautiful thing for me. I had never been a part of, but so for me to go through that leadership conference, that was a push for me. Um, just being able to talk to people there and tell them my story and, and listen to others, that was a big push for me. So um, as far as just being out in the community, I just feel like I will be a voice. I will be a voice not only for um, African-American people because uh, I don't know if you notice it or not, but um, 
the city council kind of lacks African American representation, and sure. me and Kinsley both would like to bring that to the table. Well, it, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, that's something my <coughs> next point. Something else I've noticed, at least about Kingsley, mm -hmm. you're different from any of the other candidates and anyone who's on the council right now, is that you're young. <laughs> 28 years old, uh, relatively speaking. I remember when I wasn't young, but I guess getting old is part of it. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, there is a sizable young uh, population here in Iowa City, and I'm referring even beyond. Uh, obviously the university and those uh, students there, but there's young professionals, artists, musicians, that kind of stuff. And people have run uh, unsuccessfully in the past, kind of promising to be the voice for youth. You haven't shied away from that, from what I've seen in your campaign, but I also haven't seen you say, hey, I'm your guy, you know, trust me, we're young. What though do you think, what perspective, what issues can you uh, address if elected um, that appeal or are important to the younger demographic here in Iowa City? Well, well, Catherine actually kind of talked about this beforehand. You know, well, frankly, right now, we don't have a diversity of business that really is uh, telling of a young professional or young community. Uh, when we were talking to City High kids, uh, and again, this was something that was brought up. I had said um, during a forum that, you know, there's nothing here to do for young people. And I meant that from my standpoint. Uh, and I've consistently asked that to young people, and they've said the same thing. Um, and, you unless know, you want to go get tanked sometimes. Yeah, unless you want to <laughs> unless you want to <laughs> drink or you want to eat food. I mean, it's, it's just tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, with the city hike is the same thing you know yeah. and this one guy and you'll remember him you know he was the guy that you know worked um uh, he worked pussing tables or whatever the yeah. case may be and he was like you know i don't have a lot of money but i'd like to you know do some stuff downtown and so what are you providing for me i mean it was like a million amazing question he's not even 18. um uh, uh, what are you providing for me from that aspect and he was talking about downtown that i can come and be a part of and so we really need to look at different you know why is there not a comedy house downtown you know, um, in uh, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, where my sister lives, um, they just, I mean, they just basically use an upstairs of a restaurant. Um, I think of the Lynch Street Cafe. I mean, you could just have somebody standing up there making, um, having a, com a comedy routine um, oh, yeah. and just listening while you're eating food. I mean, maybe patrons wouldn't like opt, opt out or whatever the case may be, but that could be something you did. There's more, there needs to be more live music. There needs to be arcades. There needs to just be yes. fun stuff that kids can yes. do that I would like to do. I'd love a Chuck E. Cheese. I mean, again, that's, I guess, right. a chain restaurant, but something that's local, Chuck E. Cheese, whatever the case may be. I mean, we need to have that because, Dave you know, Buster. people, yeah, people, people leave. Like, there's a, there's a gap here that, you know, we're not, Building a foundation between our, I mean, with our young people and our elderly, we're just saying, you know, you got a great education, those, University of Iowa. We'll see you later. I'll, I'll let you answer this. Those are great points, but you know what? I've I've lived in Iowa City for ten years, and I've heard the same complaints for ten years. If only we had this. If only we had that. As Catherine, as but someone you know, who's very used... involved, why why is this not happening? What is precluding these things from yeah, developing I, I'll in tell Iowa you that City? Historically, I feel like there's a. Um, that people have gone away from an entrepreneurship mm -hmm. model, and I don't mean in Iowa City, but in, and it's now a resurgence again in the past five years. I mean, I will tell you that many people have gone to a shelter of a job because, as we all know, what does that you, mean? It means that you're shel you you don't have to produce your paycheck. You, I mean, you produce your paycheck, but I mean, when you own a business, it is the the overwhelming thing of it is that you own a business. And that if you don't produce that revenue, then you don't pay your employees, and more importantly, you don't get paid. And that is a great fear for people. The other thing is I really think there's a, um, there's a mental block of financially, how much will this cost me? And we have to demystify it. I mean, Rockney has spoken to this, we all have, about demystifying this entrepreneurial process for people and making it simple. It's like, it will cost you $6,000. These are your partners. This is your bank. This is who you go to for a lease agreement. And then people will start opening their eyes if we just do that simple process and start opening more and do a survey that doesn't lead them into an answer. And people will do that, like the whole food cart phenomenon. I'm sorry, but every city I live in, we all talk that there's a food cart. You cannot, I mean, I'm gonna say a saying is probably not appropriate for television, but you cannot swing a dead cat without hitting a food cart in every other city. And here, it's like they just come out at night. But during the day and all over town, this whole food phenomenon that we could capture as well. Well, and kind of going back to your yeah. point, I mean, the, what, what was said to me when I brought up the fact that there was, no, there was nothing downtown or nothing yeah. for kids was that there is. And so it kind of speaks to Rockney's point. I mean, there is a listening element that is uh, not occurring as far as, you know, 
these points have been brought up, and I mean, not to only speak about the young people, but also diversity as well. There's been so many committees, there's been so many people talking about it for um, the longest period of time, but unfortunately, yes. the people that we continually put in council positions have said that, oh, we're working on diversity, or oh, there is a lot of stuff, young, uh, uh, stuff for people, for young people to do, and there's not. And so, there, I mean, there's, there's got to be an element where you either, um, you either just continue in the status quo and you keep saying that there is something and put it out in the media that there is something and so everybody believes that there is something when there's not, or you change the construction of how it currently is on the council and push uh, an initiative, an agenda that um, speaks to um, people that have said over and over again that there's not anything. Well, it's like you said, you know, there's... There's been talk of this for some time. There's been, if only we this, if only we that. I know, right. But what's, Just but do it. what, yeah. Wow. I would love, would love somebody to do it. It's but true. But you can't, you can't operate from city council position by fiat. You can't just issue an order and we will hear by this and it's that. It's a partnership. What are the actual things that you could do or you'd like to see the council do if you're not elected that would actually foment or, 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 or help grow those very things that, that you're talking about. I think the thing that a lot of the counselors, I think, don't do enough of is it's true that in some respects the jurisdiction of the council is very limited in terms of hiring the city manager, and obviously reviewing the city, but those are very important. But in terms of entrepreneurship, can the city make that happen just by fiat? Of course not. But what they can do is they can nurture and cultivate relationships with existing uh, makers. So for example, as people have heard me talk about before, one of the most exciting things that's happening downtown is basically two stories up above the Chade Art Gallery called Busy Coworking, where essentially you have a group of engineers, computer programmers, makers, producers, manufacturer of 3D printers that get together uh, in, in a routine basis to basically collaborate. And the key thing that they've identified that they need is they need cheap office space. That will be priority one for my downtown development strategy. We need to do everything we possible to not have the, the grade A office space because the problem with that is that you burn capital. They want to put all their money essentially into promoting the ideas. And that's what we really need to do. A second thing that I think would be very exciting that I don't think people have talked enough about is the potential for urban agriculture. I've talked to Scott Kepke and one of the things they've looked at on the south side of town. The worm guy. The worm guy at the co-op. He's one of the leading urban ag promoters in, in downtown Iowa City. We've talked about, he has a lot of existing programs that he would like to see happen, but he needs to have a city partner. For example, some of the good things he's done at the school with composting, well, who's going to actually take that compost? He wants to partner with the city on that. The second thing he wants to look at is, what do you do essentially, there's a lot of artisanal meat production. There's some facilities on the south side that they would be able to look at where you could essentially have a, but a butcher shop on the south side of town. But the current council view is butcher shop is, is that sort of a slaughterhouse. They don't get what's happening in the local hold. foods movement. And the third thing is, in terms of uh, working with the African American community, which I think has been really exciting when talking with Henry Harper on this, he's identified that so many of these kids do not eat good food. They have all this energy, and why not allow them to stick their hands in the dirt and start learning how to grow things and learn how to sell things? And that's what's really exciting. So I think we can. I think the thing here. We will be able to change the directory of this town. Those projects are already there. We simply need to unblock what's already happening. Roy, San, you were about to jump in, and then Catherine, I just want to keep everybody going here. What were you going to say? To I was how, just going to say city council can actually City do council it? can, first of all, just start the conversation. If you're just willing to embrace and say, hey, look, this is what we need to do, we can start somewhere. And it starts at the table of city council. Okay, Catherine. You know what? I, I just want to say to Rockney that I hear about busy co-working and all these things, but I don't know why you don't ever talk about the Smith District, which is really like the largest co-op that we've created in this town, and it truly a, um, a great building block for other areas of this town in terms of people working together and truly putting their funds in one location mm -hmm. and then and dispersing them to, in in a master plan. I thought that you would love that idea. I don't no, hear you no, talking and, about and it. I, the Smith District, I think, is a great concept. Yeah. I think in, in, in particular, the concept of a purchasing cooperative, yes. you've identified yeah. essentially yes. with the bag. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think also promoting the local foods and tying it into urban ag. Yes. But one of the things I have not heard them identify, mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, is identifying this huge shortage of, of, of office space for creators they to are, work in. They're doing a second floor. There is actually, you know, and this is a great project. There's a whole second floor identification project that's happening now. And ICAD uses a particular computer system that I, 
whatever. You know, I don't know the particulars of it, but they are doing that. And you know what's so is that we hear 50% we need class A office space and 50% we need um, class B or C office space. So I totally agree with you. And I think there's so many alternatives for people like that, you know, there are places down in this area that could be great office districts that could be part of the extended downtown. And I want people to office in our central business district. It's so important for the health of that area. And you're a Jane Jacobs fanatic also, and so am I, mm -hmm. to get that idea flowing. I think we're on the same page with that, but, um, but I think that there are other things we can do, like create, use partners, use experts in the field, like the downtown district, to help do these entrepreneurial ideas or help people along. Well, I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm not running for office, but I, I have an idea, and I spoke about it with Tom Marcus and, and Mayor Hayek when yeah. we had them on the show. You know, it's kind of, I was inspired by the University Project. Which I love they that take, project, right. yeah. You know, houses in somewhat disrepair and, and help stabilize neighborhood by turning mm -hmm. them over and giving yes. them to, I hate to say the term, responsible adults, but, you know, departifying houses. Well, we see, uh, you know, for good or for ill, and, and Rockney's spoken about it, about the ill of some of it, a lot of the new construction uh, mm -hmm. downtown, uh, predominantly student housing, but they have, by code, they have to have X amount of square footage of retail space, but there's they either stay empty for That's ages, right. years, or months, or there's high turnover because those rents are crazy expensive. Mm -hmm. What about a program, this was my idea, where the city, for a local business, not for Hardee's to come in or something like okay. that, but where the city either helps subsidize the rent on that yes. or buys it because, you know what, having a business in an empty spot is going to create jobs. Do a it's step have, up have Rent people process. walking back and forth. I can think of swaths of this thing, of yeah. this town Agreed. that are busy apartment blocks, but there's no businesses in there because it's just too I terribly expensive. That Is that yes. something that the city yeah. could help do, and would you be willing to do that if you were elected? I, I think yes. And the other thing I think we need to look at is really look at concept of tweaking some of the zoning code to allow more live workspaces. Mm -hmm. So essentially, in the neighborhoods, you're going to have more quiet green growth in the neighborhoods. So, for example, one of my supporters is Mark McCollum, and one of his first projects was the Brown Street Inn. And even until about two years ago, I didn't even know that the Brown State Street Inn existed. Um, it's a quiet, beautiful inn. You hardly even know that it's there, but it's a commercial property in which it's owner-occupied. I think if we're looking at creating more workspace, we need to look at uh, closely reviewing the, the city's zoning code to see whether we can allow more live workspaces so you can have some very quiet inns more pro professional creative spaces. So there are things that we can do, there's no doubt about it. What's, how is that different though? I mean, if I was, say, a graphic designer, there's nothing stopping me from working at home, but what kind of spaces are you talking about zoning-wise that'd be more commercial? Not quite a 7-Eleven in somebody's neighborhood, maybe, but what, well, what are you talking, you're talking about talking about, so for example, the end that he's doing right now on essentially College Green Park, it, there, there's some limitations in terms of how many employees you can have, essentially, if you're owner-occupied. You can't hire any employees. So we can look at tweaking those rules to maybe allow a little, a few more employees to participate in those businesses. More gallery spaces, Th those would be restrictions right now that you couldn't do in certain parts of the neighborhoods. So those are sorts of things that we need to look at. What's the goal? What's the vision? And then once elected, really do a really close review of the zoning code to see if we can allow more flexibility and then tie it into the owner-occupied. Because I do think that's important for the neighborhoods. Because it's going to be very important that we preserve the quiet, tranquil nature of the neighborhoods. Because that's what people love about Iowa City is that they have a quiet place where they can live, work, and grow, and, and read. And that's why we love it so much. And that's one aspect. I mean, that's an important aspect to do. But then also, um, and Catherine talked about it, and I think everybody's kind of talked about it to a certain extent as well, is access to resources mm -hmm. and education. Mm -hmm. It's like what she said. I mean, uh, there's this um, myth that, you know, you can't start a business because it's going to cost, ex I mean, $20,000. I'm never going to have $20,000 in my entire lifetime. Um, and so looking at it from that standpoint and saying, you know, or talking to a person, how can I do this? You know, there's a guy who wanted to start some type of medical equipment firm here, and um, he didn't know what to do. And I said, you know what you should do? You should probably call Paul Heath um, from the Small Business um, mm -hmm. the Development Center to help you out. It's a free service. Mm -hmm. They'll help you out. Talk to the Chamber of Commerce. They're really good as far as helping um, you promote it. I mean, they want business, and so they're not going to turn you down. And, um, you know, as soon as he got the information, he texted me back and said thanks. I mean, that's the type of stuff that not only a city council member should do, but also the city should push out because those are things that... So you're saying not enough people know about these. Yeah. It's access. I mean, honestly, yeah. the four of us sat down and spent one day together and created, like, what our main topics were and did access to information on all of them. We could probably just change the path of so many things of whatever our strongest suit is together, you know? Yeah. We could, and it would, it would take away... a 
you know, I know I use the word demystify again and again. I know it's annoying sometimes, but it it is that thing where people just wonder and worry and do all these things. But actually, if someone just handed me a paper, like for me, I don't know how to write grants. I am like, I should write a grant for this, but I have no idea how to find that information, and I never have known. And I could write a million grants if someone would just go to come to me and say, here's where you find the best grants yep. for this and this and this. Yep. And I could whip those things it's out. It's also from a campaign perspective. I would not have been able to run any type of campaign if I wouldn't have talked to uh, uh, Karen Cubby, if I hadn't talked to I mean, multitude of people throughout the community and asked them, you know, mm -hmm. how do I get lists? How do I, <laughs> yeah. where do I put my signs? Yeah. You know, those type of questions that I think everybody's asked. And, you know, for the most part, um, have looked to the community to answer those questions. But if there's any type of centralized way, and you're right, you know, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have um, Press Citizen, we have the Gazette, we have uh, Little Village, we have PATV. We have so many different outlets. If there's a way to kind of condense that, and I like to use the city website. City, city website's website. a mess. There's too much stuff on there. How can we do a better job as far as putting that in a way that is very, I mean, is user friendly? Mm -hmm. Currently, that's what I'm looking at as far as my job. Our website is not user friendly. I have to do a better job as far as making sure that the person who knows the least about voting could quickly go through and know the most. Yeah. I think two clicks is about the limit. Nothing should I be agree. more The than city two website clicks. is two. I mean, the type is really small. Yeah. It is basically, it's like IBM green screen. What, you know, Rock, Rockney there. mentioned the point about changing, pop or, or examining rather, uh, for zoning and various stuff. I The tiny bit of the uh, forum, which I caught at the Iowa City Public Library a few days ago, you, you raised an uh, uh, interesting thing about talking about having the different arts fests and those things, not just downtown, but having them uh, scattered throughout right the out. community, which, for instance, the 319 Music Festival, I think is great there yep, in the southeast yep. side. I've had those folks uh, on the show. But talking about downtown from it, because our town or any other town, it is the downtown. You know, that's the place to go. Right now, also on the ballot this year, which I'm astonished to think because we were talking about this. Uh, Catherine was a guest on my very first show over three years ago. And Wait, we were talking, yeah, yeah, wow. and we were talking about the whole twenty-one thing and right. the nineteen and all that. And you know, I quite honestly, I don't know how this could possibly be an issue where it's twenty-one and everywhere in the United States, but somehow Iowa City is so special. It's a human rights violation if you can't go get tanked. What's going on there? Why are we still talking about this? Having this conversation literally ad nauseum. And uh, and how where do you all stand on that? I mean, there's there's going to be some support for this. I don't know if it'll be enough to get it passed. John D. Uh, thinks it's the you know most important thing since you know polio vaccine. <laughs> Thank you, John. But uh, but where, where do you stand on that, and why is this still an ongoing issue here in this town? It's an ongoing issue because you have you know two very um, distinct sides that one you know want to support um, you know lowering the drinking age uh, again uh, not necessarily obviously in the illegal way because it's 21 everywhere but um, having that opportunity to go into bars when they're younger than 21. I do think it's weird because if you lower it to 19, you're still leaving out the entire 18-year-old population, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, and then you have the uh, the 21 or the more right. people who are responsible or people who purport to be responsible saying that, you know, uh, we, we want to change the downtown culture. We want to do different things. You know, I find myself on this side, but not necessarily for that particular reason. Uh, I, I do, I will say that it has changed the culture. Um, for me, I'm 28, for the better, because I don't necessarily have a dog in this fight, um, but as, as far as, you know, uh, looking at that particular ordinance, we have to, this is another situation uh, where we've kind of talked about briefly before. We have an ordinance. We've made an ordinance. We've restricted people from um, doing a certain thing. What are we doing from that 21 to 18-year-old gap? Mm -hmm. Because that is money lost. Pe All right, I don't want to speak, I guess, too personally, but there's people that will spend 60 to $100 a night drinking at bars. You've already said that. <laughs> <laughs> we know it too. <laughs> There's people that have spent so, uh, substantial money drinking at bars. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Why can't we figure out a way yeah. to spend that money in another place? No, what hello. happens in other college towns? What do they do? They do other things. They have live music on the streets. They yeah. have um, different venues, different shows yeah. that you can go to. Things they are spend more spread ways. around. I mean, yes. Iowa City, we're so geographically close to the university. I mean, it is literally one inch away from, you know, my store. And not in a bad way, but in, I feel like in other cities where it's a little more geographically um, or just scattered. It's so central in Iowa City that, and I feel like that's why everyone goes to downtown. Sorry, Kingsley. It is the center of the town. It is in a million other towns. I, you know, 
I don't disagree no, with no, you. No, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just saying, I know like, that you other... I'm just giving you, yeah, but, but I just feel like we do have to give them more stuff to do. Hello, yes. Yeah, but I mean, but it speaks to, you know, however much the university might poo poo these rankings. <laughs> well, we don't give any, you know, we're now the number one party school. I know. The more they've clamped down on it, it's, we went from like ninth to fourth to second to one. Each <laughs> new wave of things, more people know who Bot the Sam is than Irving Weber. Okay? I know. Yeah. That is, like it or not, that is the de facto for the next yeah. few months. That is the mascot of this town. What can the city do in partnership with the university, which for a long time my feeling was they were kind of like the university is like, hey, we brought them in, yeah. you deal with it. Yeah. What can the city do? And it takes time. It's not yeah. going to wave your magic wand right. and people are going to become, you know, Harry Nation. But what's going to happen? Um, is it is it going to be putting in more businesses like that? Is it going to be diversifying what what's existing downtown, which a fair amount has already happened? What has to happen to, to course correct? Iowa City's relationship with alcohol, which there was a very mm -hmm. good article, pardon me, uh, opinion in the Press Citizen today mm -hmm. about it, and even I refer to it, I'm like, this is like post-collapse Soviet Union level drinking problem, almost, this town across the board, and it's not just young people. No, I agree. And they have Kinnick, they show the arrest stats, like 80% of the arrested were like over 40, so there's something about No, I about see it, it's the parents place. with the kids, I'm downtown every Saturday, weekend, yeah. 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 So yeah. What Everyone's do we do, wasted. What do we do to change Rocky, the culture what would you of do? this town? <laughs> well, I, I think one thing that's been lost is, is, the main problem that we really saw was essentially when it was 19, were these people that would come in from out of town, they would start pounding down their shots, and then go into the neighborhood. And it really did have a detrimental act, um, impact on the neighborhoods. But in terms of tweaking it, I would like to see more flexibility if, in fact, you essentially have a beer bar, where you just essentially have a beer tap. You're serving um, low percentage alcohol beer, and you're not allowing essentially hard liquors. I would like more flexibility as far as that goes. The second thing is we essentially right now have... With a nod and a wink to letting under 21s access? No, I, not with a nod and a wink. I think in terms of potentially modifying okay. the policy. I, I think that's something you could look at doing. I know, for example, Madison has essentially... Wisconsin a, was like that. They have a beer... The, yeah. the, the union used to have a beer tap. And mm -hmm. I think if you have it, you have limited hours. You have it up until 11 o'clock. I think we can have more flexibility. But the second thing is, is we've already have this live music exemption, essentially with the mill. I think we really got to look at expanding that as well. Mm -hmm. They've shown that they can be responsible... Um, so if, if we can essentially expand that, because I think live music is going to be a critical part of what we do downtown. Um, even you look at the Engler, that is a live music venue. They serve alcohol there as well. Uh, those are the things we really need to look at do. But those would be two ways that I'd really like to modify the current policy that I think would really make sense to balance essentially the neighborhoods being quiet while allowing for commercial growth downtown. I, there's so many things I'd love to talk about. I just got a, a nod from Duluth. We only have 10 minutes left, so I, I want to throw out the big elephant in the room, the thing that's uh, very critical to this election, a lot of people are talking about, and that is, of course, race. People have talked about various constituencies, various community parts of the community not being represented, very specific problems to that. I will defer to uh, Kingsley and Roy San on this. I'll throw it at them. What, what's, the, what's the one function of that issue that you think to be most problematic, and how do you think you can change it if elected? Do you want me to start first? Or do you want to go? <laughs> um, the police. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody has um, talked about. That's what I have talked about, not only um, with this run, but also um, uh, during the Ad Hoc Diversity Committee. Uh, you know, you, you never want to be that person that talks about the police, because then you're thinking, you know, hey, I got to make sure I drive extra slow going home. <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, <laughs> we have, and I want to make sure this is on air, I mean, we have good officers. Yes. We have that. I know three, four, five, six of officers, and they're great people. What I think is the problem is overemphasis on policies and procedures on a, uh, a particular subset of the population, that it isn't across the board. Um, students feel some sa the same way as far as policing practices um, downtown. I mean. We, we have to look, I mean, the problem is is that Iowa City for some reason feels like, you know, um, uh, a, a big city when you're talking about policing um, issues and how, you know, there's this overemphasis on drugs, there's overemphasis on, um, on <laughs> African Americans um, that haven't necessarily done something. I mean, I'll, I'll use this anecdotal story. You know, um, there's, a, there's a company, uh, a theater company that comes into town. They literally tell, and this is the saddest thing I've ever heard, they tell the, um, um, the minority people that work for your company, you will be stopped five to six times while you're down here in Iowa City. Are, are you serious? Driving while black. Well, drive, I mean, driving while, I mean, are you, I mean, is that, I mean, can, I mean, is, is, a, is a, a company is actually saying that to citizens that are coming into town or residents that are 
will be coming into town or visitors that will be coming into town. That's ridiculous. It cannot happen here. Because if it, if it is happening here, then why, why am I here? I can go home and be, I, mean, I can go home in the sense of South Carolina where I was raised um, and deal with the same type of treatment and at least know my place. <laughs> But I mean, here it's just it, it's I just it's unfathomable. I just don't understand why we are going through this issue. And again, you know, diversity is a relatively young question or topic here in Iowa City. Uh, I think we need to really, you know, take off the gloves and put hands in it. You know, get in the dirt, be that worm guy, whatever yeah. the case may be, and really have honest discussions. What can you do? What will you do if elected? Talk. I mean, again, yeah. oh, oh, let, me, let me say this because Morrison brought a good point. We've talked a lot about these issues. What we need to do is have a data-driven analysis because to me, that change, because there's two sides. There's, there's, there's the minority people who have said this is happening consistently, consistently. There's people that don't understand and wondering why you know, you're talking about Iowa City in this, the, this, uh, this sense and that you know, it's nationally being televised that you know, you're eight times more likely um, to um, be arrested for smoking marijuana if you're black rather than if you're white, and that's a ridiculous stat, but it's a national stat. Iowa, as far as disproportionate minority contact, is one of the highest states in the country. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean talking. What it means is um, putting people in um, decision-making positions uh, to really look through uh, these ordinances that we're putting out or these policies that we're putting out to make sure that they're not, you know, overemphasized in a racially biased way or even in a socioeconomic way. I think we really need to do a better job. Roy Sand, I read your, uh, oh, I read all of your great interviews with all of you in Little Village Magazine. People watching can check that out. I think the term you used was you want to see the police go from a, uh, right now it's control and maintain and go back to a serve and protect. What is what is control and maintain? How is that manifested in a, in a bad way in your community, in the people you speak to and you're involved with? How is that bad or not? How is it bad? And how is it poorly affecting your lives and what can you will do, you do uh, to change that if you're elected? That literally came from the ad hoc committee's report um, stating um, actually there was a video of becoming an officer here which was taken down and it was very, very militant, but they removed it. So once we started talking about it, the video had been taken down, but it was a controlled and monitor instead of a protect and serve. People here do feel like, literally, you do not get no justice. I'm not gonna bite my tongue. I'm not afraid to bite my tongue. I've been saying this for years. Racism exists in Iowa City, and then until we embrace it, we have to talk about it. And when Kinsey said we need to talk, I'm so tired, that ain't the word I want to use, but I'm tired of talking. It's time to walk the walk. We have been, every committee we've talked to, Coalition for Justice, the consultation of religious communities come together. They put a forum together. Everybody is just just bringing stuff together, but it's it's just a lot of talk. What does that mean, walk the walk? What do you do? What policies, changes, what do you do? Are we going to have to, if we have to model other cities, let's, Let's get together, let's talk about it, let's see what's working in other cities. If it's not working here, we need to follow suit on somebody Have else. Have they found other cities to benchmark against? Yes. Okay. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, the, we did um, Seattle. And another thing, yes, we did Seattle. Mm -hmm. Seattle was one. Um, Portland, Oregon did something. It's in the report. So if you look at that, there are other cities that we can model, but we have to be willing to sit down and not just keep continue. We've been talking about this for years. It's time to walk the walk. You know, it's time as a city council person, I will be willing to talk with. I've said many times, I have no problems with the Iowa City Police. I've had my run in and I was, to me, I felt like I was racial profiled by the Iowa City Police when I gave my 17-year-old daughter a birthday party and a fight broke out. Next thing you know, I called the police. By the time the police get there, I was uh, talking to the police officer, telling him, okay, we had certain kids were still left at the party. I'm pointing at the kids that was fighting, thinking that they was gonna get them. They did nothing, you know? I had two police officers tell me, well, you shouldn't have been out here fighting. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So the party was on a Saturday night. How was that racial profiling? Because the party was on a Saturday night. I left that party Monday morning. Not more, I'm sorry, not Monday morning. Tuesday morning, I was on the front page of the uh, Press Citizen, the Gazette, the Daily Iowa, I had been charged with a disorderly house. I knew nothing about it. I received a call from a, um, my job stating that I had been placed on a leave of absence and I was charged with a disorderly house, which is a simple misdemeanor. It's a hundred dollar fine. Not only that, they went and got a warrant for my arrest on a simple misdemeanor. Make that make sense. So with all that being said, that's behind me. Um, I, it was thrown out of court on a direct verdict, acquittal. 
they never once you know newspaper none of them went back to retract to say she was charged why did not say oh all they had was porter found not guilty no porter was found not guilty on the direct verdict mean i didn't even have to get up and testify to just didn't want to hear no more after they put their people up for the prosecutor so you know tell me that's not racial profiling quick thing procedure so looking at which we talking about looking at policies and procedures for example if you have a, 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 a driver who cannot speak English yes. there should not be four cars that show up there should be one car that is the officer that is assessing so the situation. So each car doesn't have a different translator in it? Yeah, I mean, me. that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, there has to be a situation where you have a, a direct policy. And Rodney can speak to this as well. When you go through law school, you want that finite print in, finite print, is that even a word? Mm -hmm. That fine print in the policy and procedure that says this is how you will um, conduct this policy and procedure so people, one, can be educated on the manner and know that, you know, it's not a particular situation that they are, um, you know, um, looked at in a racial fair. way, whatever the case may be. It's fair. And know that they can look at that. And so when I talk about that story, I think it's ridiculous because, you know, to have four police cars for one person who can't mm -hmm. um, speak English, but then ask their um, um, their uh, kids in a, in a very illegal way um, to translate for their mother when it could be something that um, would possibly put her in jail, possibly put her um, produce a fine. You know that's not how that's not becoming of a police department. And I'm sure that the police department does not want to be seen in that way. Almost out of time. Okay. Got 90 seconds left. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just about out of time. But it just dawned on me, with the exception of Catherine, who's born here and raised, but she went away and came back. Every one of us sitting at this table is not from Iowa City. But I'd like to think that we all love this town a great deal. Yes. I think we do. We've made in our own ways contributions to it. One word, two words answer, because we're just about out of time. There's so many people, and Rockney's spoken a lot about this. We've talked about this even before you ran. Young, talented people come here, get educated, caps out. on, they're out the door. How do we keep them around? Really quick, two words, go down the line, and we'll say goodnight. Culture of startups. How do we keep them around, Roxanne? Putting compassion back into public service. Diversity of business. Uh, housing and I, I think housing and diversity of business, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank you all so very much for joining us. If any folks at home, they want to find out more about the last few uh, events you'll be at, read your websites, that kind of stuff. Where can they find you online? Rockney? RockneyCole.com. Roy Fan Porter for Council. KingsleyForCouncil.com. Champion for City Council. Well, listen, com. thank you all for joining us. Everyone watching at thank home, you. I will not tell you who to vote for, <laughs> but I will tell you to please go out there and vote. November 5th, this coming Tuesday, here in Iowa City, early voting's all over. If you're out my house, come to the bathroom. There's an old lady in there ready to let you go. Thanks so very much for watching, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Yale. All righty. Right on time, huh, yeah?